Good to see you guys tonight. How are you doing tonight? Doing well? Yeah, it's a good, good night. So, so good to see you. I wanna welcome everyone in the room. Welcome those of you that are watching online. And uh, I'm looking forward to hot rods and hot dogs and uh, you can smell them in the lobby, can't you? As a matter of fact, you know, if in the middle of the message you get a little hungry, just hold your hand up. They'll bring you a hot dog right in the middle. <laughs> They're not gonna do that. You gotta wait, okay? It's a, that's not gonna happen. So this is week four in a teaching series called Insomnia. And insomnia is a sleep disorder in which there is difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, it's sleeplessness. Some of us struggle with it more than others. We've all probably had a night or two or a lot where we just can't fall or stay asleep. And the tagline underneath that is, what keeps you up at night? In week one, we talked about um, grudges and bitterness and unforgiveness, and we, we tried to let go of the pain. And then week two was about fear. That'll keep you up at night. And last week, Pastor Tim, he talked about purpose. Lack of purpose will keep you up at night. Tonight, I want to talk to you about regret. Just good old-fashioned regret. Regret over past things. That'll just keep you up at night. Now, I'm not a golfer. <clears throat> um, golf spelled backwards is flog. It is painful. <clears throat> I'm a, I love to fish. But I do understand golf. I love to watch it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's such a hard sport, and it is a sport, and so I'll watch it sometimes on TV. There's a guy that's golfing, and his ball's on the, the ladies' tee, the, the women's tee, and for those of you that are non-golfers, I mean, the pin, the hole is that way, and the ladies' tee is closer than the men's tee is a little further away, because men generally can hit further than women, so there's a ladies' tee. And he's hitting from the ladies' tee. He has his ball, and he's just about ready to hit, and there's an announcer on the PA system said, Sir, would you move from the ladies' tee to the men's tee? And he just kind of shrugs it off and goes back down. He said, Sir, would you please move from the ladies' tee to the men's tee? And he just stopped. He said, Would the guy on the PA please shut up so the man on the ladies' tee can hit his second shot? <clears throat> so... Sometimes you need a second shot. Maybe you've come into church before. And is there another shot for me? Can I get a do-over? Because there's just regret over past decisions. And I get that. I want to start off with a question. You think about this. Um, who do you love and how do you show it? Who do you love and how do you show it? I was 19 years old when I reached over to kiss Lori Hunter, who would eventually become my wife. And I leaned in and I kissed her on the forehead and said, I love you. And she puckered up and closed her eyes and said, a little lower. <clears throat> and I said, I love you. Okay, that never happened, that never happened. I'm sorry, but it's a bad joke, but. <laughs> now, who do you love and how do you show it? I mean, it's easy for us to love the people that love us, or at least a little bit easier to love the people that love us. But even the people that love us, that we love, we still have conditions on that, it seems. And, and we're really conditional about who we choose to love. And we, live, we love nice people, we love kind people, we love beautiful people, we love smart people, we love athletic people, but all people? Well, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it, to love all people? Let me ask you this question. Who does God love, and how does he show it? Now, you've probably thought about that before. I mean, who does God love? And if I told you that, well, he loves people like Billy Graham and Mother Teresa and those kind of clean slate type people, then you could say, yeah, I could get on board with that. I could see how that he would love those kinds of people. I think he loves them. But how many of you truly believe that the same God has equally abiding love toward Adolf Hitler and Charles Manson, and Ted Bundy, and Jeffrey Dahmer, Osama bin Laden, Vladimir Putin. I mean, does God love them? I mean, does he love them just as much? Now, we know that God certainly does not condone their actions. In fact, their behavior, it angers God. But does he still love them? Does God's love extend to the drug dealer that's 
hanging out around the school trying to get young kids addicted? Does God's love extend to the terrorist? Does God love the bribe-taking politician? Does he love the scam artist who's trying to prey on the elderly? Does God love the child pornographer? Do these people matter to God? Now, do some of you struggle over some of these possibilities? I think we all do. I think we do. I wanna encourage you, if you have your Bible, to go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15 tonight. It's a pivotal passage in the New Testament. One day, Jesus was teaching, and people were just drawn to him because he taught like no one else and he loved people like no one else and it says in Luke chapter 15 verse 1 that tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach and so I mean I mean these disreputable people would often come to hear Jesus I mean they wouldn't come to hear the Pharisees or the religious leaders but they came to Jesus because he taught like nobody else he told stories that would just captivate people and they came and they came by the thousands to hear him to listen to him because they were drawn to him. Verse two, it says, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people. That's the way they viewed them, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. So that's the backdrop. That's the kind of what's going on here. Jesus knows that the Pharisees that are over there on to the side in their holy huddle that are kind of looking over at Jesus and pointing their bony self-righteous fingers at him because he's hanging out with, well, irreligious people. He just is. Look at him. The Son of God is associating with immoral people. So therefore, he cannot possibly be the Son of God. And he relates to them, they say. He listens to them. He's eating dinner with them. He's laughing now. It's as if he actually enjoys being with them. I mean, it's one thing to endure these irreligious people, but it's another thing altogether to enjoy being around them. He couldn't possibly be a prophet of God. They thought they had God's character all figured out. And this really angered Jesus. And so Jesus tells three stories. He tells us a story about a lost sheep and a lost coin, and then he tells a story about a lost son. And the story of the lost son is one of the most familiar stories in all the Bible. It's the parable of this rebellious, defiant, immoral young man, the parable of the prodigal, the prodigal son. And it's with this simple story that Jesus answered once and for all the, the question, under what conditions does God love us? Because I wanna know. What are the conditions that God loves me? What are the conditions that God loves you? So we're gonna look quickly at four lessons about God's loving nature from Luke 15. And if you ever wanna know what kind of church we are, we are a Luke 15 kind of church. This is like a, just the foundational passage for us here at Community. So first of all, God is a God who loves us when we make foolish choices. So I'm thankful for that because I don't know about you, I've made some foolish choices in the past and I don't think I'm probably done with making some foolish choices. And he's a God who loves us when we make foolish choices. And now notice how the parable begins. Luke 15, chapter, I mean, chapter 15, verse 11. Let's go ahead and read this out loud together. I'm not gonna ask you to read a bunch of verses tonight. I'm gonna let you kind of save up your energy for hot rods and hot dogs out there. But you guys, you can at least read this verse. So let's go, here we go. It's just a few words. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. So he had two sons, and his younger son, well, he's at odds. There's this tension that's going on between a father and a son, and that's never happened before, but it's happening here, this tension that's going on. I heard about a teenager who said, Dad, I'm leaving to go to the party, and his dad yelled, well, have a good time. And the son said, look, Dad, don't tell me what to do. I mean, there's some tension that was going on in, in that relationship for sure. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them, between the younger son and the older son. And it's a pretty bold request because the estate really was an inheritance that would be given upon the death of the father. So in a sense, the son was saying, dad, uh, you know, I kind of wish you, was, you were dead. You know, drop dead, dad, give me my money. Give me what I want. And you know, <clears throat> what they say, where there's a will, there's a relative, I mean, there just is, and there's this young man, and 
this little five-year-old boy. He went to his uh, grandfather and, and, he, and he said, Grandma, I mean, Grandpa, can you make the sound of a frog? And his grandfather said, who gave you the idea that I can make the sound of a frog? And he said, well, Mommy said that you could. I heard her tell Daddy that we're all going to be rich when you croak. <laughs> you know. Now, being a grandfather, that is just not right. That is not right. I told that story uh, four years ago here at Community, and it was a couple months later we had a family vacation. I got a son, Chris, that lives in Charlotte, and a son, Steve, that lives in Phoenix, and they brought their families. We're all together. And I, I noticed that there's some whispering going on between our oldest son, Chris, and his nephew, Jeremiah, who was five at the time. And then Jeremiah he just turns to me and says, Pop, Pop, can you make the sound of a frog? <laughs> and, I, and in that moment I go, well, at least Chris is watching the messages online, so that's good. I, that's a positive there, but don't mess with my grandkids. Chris, you're still out of the will. So that's there. I got to be careful on that. <clears throat> but the prodigal says, I want my share and I want it now. Have you ever noticed some of the first words out of the mouth of a child after mama and dada is mine? I mean, a little toddler, a little toddler girl sees another girl playing with her doll. She runs over there and says, mine. So dad, you try to take a lick from your son's ice cream cone, he pulls away and says, mine. <clears throat> Ladies, if you reach over and try to take the remote control from your husband, he's gonna say, mine, mine. It's, it's what we say, mine. Usually when we make mine type of decisions, it leads to foolish choices, it just does. And we're not told whether the father in this story tried to reason with the son how this is not gonna play out well. It's not gonna end well for you. <clears throat> But this was a strong-willed boy who had his mind made up. One of the toughest parts of being a parent is to know when to hold on and when to let go. I gotta be honest, that is a tough part and this loving dad knew. He knew it was time to, to let go. He just said, it's time. <clears throat> Maybe he could see that the only way his son was gonna learn a life lesson is through his own mistake. He's not gonna learn it from somebody else. He's gonna have to learn that through his own hard experience. So he makes the decision to let his son go, to make this very foolish, unwise decision. And letting go requires some of the most intense love that a parent can give to their child, it, it just does. And now besides the Pharisees, who, who's listening to Jesus tell this story again? It's the tax collectors and it's the notorious sinners. So they're listening to Jesus tell this story about someone who is in the process of making some very wise, I mean unwise, very foolish decisions. And there's no question that they had made some very foolish decisions along the way. And Jesus is saying, just like a father loves a son, even when he makes some bad decisions, foolish choices, our heavenly father loves us when we choose poorly. And I, I'm thankful for that because sometimes I've, I've chosen and choose poorly. I, I mean, some of our biggest swan dives into disaster just started with an unwise, foolish choice. Uh, and a foolish relationship choice or a foolish financial choice or a foolish alcohol or drug choice or a foolish marriage choice. And, and it just started with one choice and we made a decision and it just, just ended up in a disaster. And, but God loves us even when we make foolish choices. Now, before I go on, I wanna recommend a book because I like to resource you and, and we're talking about a father and a son. So I'm gonna recommend to you one, one of the best resources for someone, for a student age 15 to 25, even up to 30. I mean, I, I still get value from this book. <clears throat> Lori and I have given out this book to more than any other book. I love buying books and giving them to people. I just do, because if I find a book that is like, this is, this is gold here, this is, this is like, this is the stuff. <clears throat> and, and we've given dozens and dozens and dozens of copies of this book out over the years. Now, it is called Ask It, now, previously, it was called The Best Question Ever. It's written by Andy Stanley. It is a great book. And there's a question, a question that as he walks you through and it, it kind of grows and he helps you to, to process this question. And it's just so helpful for someone just to not to, to train wreck their life. And, and I, I think this book is, is good for anyone, frankly, and, and it's such a, a great book. But if you, have, if you have a student that's graduating from high school, and whether they're graduating, you know, magna cum laude or, or summa cum laude or just, poo, thank you, laude. I mean, whatever, however they're graduating, it's a great book to get for them. And well, I just ordered 10 more yesterday. I said, I'm going to get some more and give them out. This is such a great book. So I want to encourage you. 
There's some wisdom in this resource so that we don't undo what God wants to do, that we make wise choices along the way. Second lesson that Jesus communicates through this story is that God is a God who loves us when we fail. Now we can make wise, unwise choices, but then those choices often end up in, in failure. And we can be thankful that God is the God who loves us when we fail, because we all fail. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Let's read this verse out loud together, okay? Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Squandered his wealth in wild living. Doesn't take a lot of imagination to think what's going on there. I mean. He's going clubbing on South Beach on the Sea of Galilee is what he's doing there. I mean, he's drawn to the neon lights of the lost Baghdad Strip. I mean, that's what he's doing. This young man, he gets a convertible chariot. <clears throat> he's got the music going loud. He's got a case of beer. He's got a backseat full of girls who just love his money. And he throws out his parents' value system. He throws out his own system of morality. He's doing everything that he ever wanted to do that he couldn't do when he lived at home. And he drives fast and he drives hard. And it's not hard to picture a kid like this. And he's just throwing away his money with drinks and high-priced call girls and snorting his fortune up his nose. And, and every day was another party. Every night was another woman. And he had friends. He had lots of friends. He had an entourage because he had a lot of money. And then when the money was gone, the friends were gone. But he had this, <clears throat> this wild, sensual spree. And the father's heart just breaks as he sees him leave because he knows about what's to happen because the father can see further down the path than the son can. And the son blows it in his own sin and his wild living and his poor choices. Any parents identify with this story? Let me ask you, do you think the father knew that his son was gonna waste that money when he gave it to him? <laughs> I think so. Do you, do you think that the father knew that his son was headed for some trouble? Undoubtedly so. Do you think the father wanted to follow his son and just bail him out and rescue him? What parent wouldn't want to do that? But his father knew that sometimes the most, most loving thing that you can do is to allow your kids to fail. I remember years ago, we had Bob Barnes speak to a parenting conference, and he said something that kind of struck me as odd, but I reflected on it, because I was a young parent. This is a long time ago now. And, uh, and, and he said that failure in childhood is helpful. And a lot of times, you know, parents just rush in and rescue and don't allow kids to fail, and really set them up for failure in adulthood, which is not helpful. Sometimes that's catastrophic. I own an interesting book titled America's Least Competent Criminals. <laughs> Tales of would-be outlaws who have botched, bungled, and otherwise helpless, haplessly, but hilariously fumbled their crimes. I mean, it's full of just crazy, true stories. One of my favorites is a guy who was arrested as a suspect in a crime in Pennsylvania. And so they brought him into like an interrogation room and uh, they put a colander, like a kitchen colander on his head and they had a wire attached to it and the wire went to the back of a, copy machine, before he got into the interrogation room, which was just a copy machine room, they, they put a piece of paper on the glass that said he's lying. And then every time they asked him a question, when he re responded, one of the officers would just press the button and then out would shoot a piece of paper that said he's lying. They'd ask another question, he'd respond, he's lying, he's lying, he's lying. Finally, you know, this lie detector test, this sophisticated lie detector test, it fooled him and he confessed to the crime. It was an epic, epic fail. It's just kind of hilarious, you know, when you think about that. But God loves us when we fail. And the prodigal son has failed. The one who had it all, he, he lost it all. He's broke and he's penniless, he's hungry. The party, it was fun while it lasted, but it's not any fun anymore. The party's over. And to top it off, this kosher Jewish boy ends up with the worst possible job imaginable. He's feeding pigs, unclean pigs. It couldn't get any worse for a young Jewish male working on a pig farm. And it's during this time that we learn thirdly that we have a God who loves us while he waits. While he waits for our return. Can you picture the father at home? I mean, he's just scanning the horizon. He's waiting for his son to come home. Maybe he gets reports about his son 
working on a pig farm, just kind of shaking his head. He, he knew he was headed for trouble. And all this father could do was sit patiently and wait for his kid with no apparent change. And that's the hardest thing, isn't it? When you're a parent and you have an adult child and you just pray and you pray and you pray and you wait and you wait. And of course, in the meantime, things go from bad to worse for this young man, the prodigal. Verse 14, after he had been everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, you never want to get to the point where you're fighting a pig for food. That's not a good day. That's, that's not where you want to end up. This guy's hungry and it can't get any worse and it's rock bottom. And I think there's probably some of us in this room who've had a pig pen, rock bottom experience in life. And the truth about most of us is this, is we don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat, when the pain of life becomes so hard, that's when we begin to think about changing, when the pain gets too intense. C.S. Lewis was a great, brilliant thinker of the last century. And he had this to say about pain and how God leverages pain. God whispers to us in our pleasure, C.S. Lewis said. I mean, meaning that we really can't hear the voice of God very well when life's going smoothly. He, it's a whisper. He speaks to us in our conscience, but God shouts to us in our pain. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And, and I want you to know that God will use pain in your life and he's used pain in my life. He uses pain as a wake up call. And I'm telling you, friends, God loves you so much that he will allow you to hit rock bottom. So hard that the only place left to look is up. The only place left to turn is to him. The only hand left to hold is to hold on to the hand of God. He loves you so much that he will allow that to happen. Why? Because he wants you to return home. Because we don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. And he wants us to come to him. Verse 17, the most popular parenting hope when he came to his senses. I mean, if you're a parent, you probably prayed that, you know. God, please help them to come to their senses. I prayed that for me. Help me to come to my senses. You wonder how many times that dad prayed that prayer. God, help my boy to come to his senses. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And so, I mean, he knows the path that he's taken has just not ended well at all. And we don't know what was the point, the breaking point? I mean, life wasn't going well. Somebody suggested, a commentator, and, and I like this, that maybe, maybe he was just kind of, you know, he's trying to get some water out of the pig trough where there's water for the pigs or a little pond, and it's, the water's nasty, but that's all he has. And he looks down, and he sees his own reflection in the water, and he goes, oh my word, look at me. Look at what I've become. I mean... Look at me, just smell me, I'm broke, I'm homeless, I'm hungry. I've hit rock bottom. When you hit rock bottom, it could be the best thing that ever happens to you because you go through a hell of an experience that points you heavenward maybe, that God is calling you out of that. And sometimes it takes that rock bottom pig pen experience for us to change. It's not enough just to have regret over what's gone on, the regret has to turn to repentance. The regret has to turn to a decision. The regret has to say, I'm not gonna live this way anymore. And so he says, I'm getting out of here. I'm going home, not for a change of clothes, but for a change of life. And, and friends, before we move on, I'm just interested tonight. How many of you in here, would you say that this is, is your story? I mean, how many of you had a prodigal experience sometime in your life where you just hit rock bottom and when you looked up, there was a father, there was God who was waiting for you and he just called you home. Would you just go ahead and raise your hand if you would? I mean, my hand is up on that. Friends, I want you to see the hands in here. This is not just some 2,000 year old fable. This, this is real life. This is, 
We have a God who is greater than our past. We do. He is greater than your past. And you don't have to live a life of regret. He loves us while he just waits and waits and waits for us to return. And the fourth lesson, this one's really pretty easy to understand that he loves us. He loves us when we come home. I mean, he loves us all throughout the journey, but he loves us when we come home. And and so Luke 15 verse 20 is one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. So he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. There's so much that's happening in this verse. First of all, three of my favorite words in the Bible. He got up. He didn't just stay and wallow in his regret. He, he got up. He, he was tired of the mess that was his life. He got up. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to stay where he was. He got up. He got up and he started to move toward a future. He got up. He wanted things to be different. He got up so he could go home to the Father. He got up. He didn't just stay where he was. And maybe that's what you need to do tonight is you just need to, to get up and make a decision. And God's been moving in so many great ways over the last few weeks. It's been incredible to see him at work. And and you've been here and you've been watching it. But you've been holding back. And maybe tonight is your night. And in a few moments, I'm going to be done. And we're going to sing a final song. And then when we're done, and you just, after the service is over, you can come forward and talk to one of our decision counselors. But you you have to get up. Now, that, that's, just, that's just part of what's going on in this, in this verse. It says, he got up. But then it says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. Just want to remind you, Jesus is telling this story. It's a parable now, so Jesus is filling in all the details. It, there might have been some context where things happened. It might have been that Jesus is crafting this parable to say all kinds of truths that he wants us to get. But Jesus, be clear. He is picturing that he is the father. Jesus is the one who is running to the prodigal. He's the one who is going to meet him, who's scanning the horizon, who sees the lost son. And God the Father, in this imagery, is Jesus himself, and he's rushing out there. And I want you to know, if there are a thousand steps between you and Jesus, he'll take the first 999. But you have to get up. You have to get up. You have to get up. And I love this imagery. This is the only time in the entire Bible where God ran. It's the only one. God runs to us in our defiance, in our rebellion. He runs to us because he wants us to come home. Isaiah 30 verse 18 says, the Lord, he longs to be gracious to you. Isaiah 118, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. And verse 24 The father in this parable that Jesus told says, for the son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now, well, he's found. So they began to celebrate. My kid is home, my kid is home. Friends, God is longing for the day when we return to him. Now, again, I said that this is the third of three stories. There's the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And before Jesus started this story, he made a a statement that is is so phenomenal. He, He said in, And chapter 15, verse 10, he said about searching for the lost. He said, in the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I was a youth pastor for years, and I used to tell, you know, the students, and even when I was here for a number of years, until I saw this differently, I used to say, you know, that, that when one person comes to faith, the angels rejoice in heaven. I think they do. But that's not what this says. It doesn't say the angels rejoice says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Now, who's in the presence of the angels? It's the Father. So Jesus is saying here, it's not just imagery, friends. It's fact. It's the Father is the one who starts this cosmic celebration. He's the one that initiates the rejoicing. It's the Father is the one that says, my child who was lost is found. My child who was gone has come home and there's this unrestrained joy from one end of heaven to the other when one person who is far from God comes home that's how much he loves us that's how much he loves you and friends when you think about this unrestrained joy this cosmic celebration that takes place, then it's not just words on a page. 
It's not just, God's love is not just theology. It's real. It's personal. And frankly, it's overwhelming at times when the love of God, when you sense that, that he loves you that much, that he would run to you and your defiance and my defiance and rebellion because he wants us to come home. He's just waiting, just waiting for us to get up and to take one step. He's there. I mean, when we get that, that kind of love just can ambush your heart. That God loves you that much. Now, I've been doing this long enough that I, I, I know where some of you are at on this. And you've been thinking about making a decision. And you say, I, I will when, when I clean up my act. I, I will when I get things straightened out. I, I, I will when I put my faults and my addictions and my hangups and my problems behind me. When, when, I, when I get kind of cleaned up and now I'm a little bit more lovable for God, that's when I'll decide. And Jesus emphatically says, no, no, absolutely no. You just come as you are. You just get up, you take one step, that's enough. And then I'll come toward you. And then God brings his Holy Spirit industrial strength cleaner into our lives. And that's when the process of transformation happens after we decide to follow him. We don't try to clean up our lives before. We have to have a repentant spirit. Yes, I get that. We don't change ourselves to make ourselves more acceptable to him. We come to him. We come to him and he comes to us. So the question again is who does God love? And how does he show it? Oh, he loves you. He loves me. He, God loves lost people. He loves confused people, he loves addicted people, he loves sinful people, he loves immoral people, he loves rebellious people, he loves irreligious people, he loves good people. I mean, maybe you have a smaller pile of sin compared to other people that might have a big, huge honking pile of sin, but we all have our stuff, we all have our sin. And, and it's not in my notes, but I just need to remind you, friends, that good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. So whether you have a small pile of sin compared to other people and you can't identify with the prodigal, you haven't gone in the far country, you've tried to lead a life that's God honoring. And, and that's a great thing. That is a great thing. That's what I'm hopeful for my sons. I didn't want them to have a prodigal experience like I had. But they still had their stuff. We all have our stuff. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. And God calls us. And if we just get up, he'll just, he'll run toward us. He'll run toward us. So Jesus offers you the invitation. Come on, come to me. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you sleepless at night? Come to me and I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace and I'll give you life and, and I'll give you hope. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you just have to get up and come home. He is the God of the second chance. We can be thankful that he gives us another shot. We don't have to live a life of regret. Regret can fuel and be a catalyst to change or we can stay in the muck and the mire of a life of regret and that'll keep us up. Or we can say, I'm done with that. My past is past and I'm gonna move forward into a great future. And Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness. And he doesn't want us to live a life of regret. He wants to live a life of fullness and he's inviting you to do that tonight. Would you go ahead and bow your head with me as I prepare to pray? I just wanna lead you for a moment. For some of you, friends, it's time. It's time to make this decision. What a difference it would be in your life. There'd be freedom, there'd be grace, there'd be forgiveness, there'd be mercy. There'd be a weight that would be lifted from your life. And I guarantee you that Jesus said that there will be a cosmic celebration in heaven because of you, because of your decision. That's how much you individually matter to God. And the Father's watching 
right now. He's for you. He's, he's not against you. He's calling you to come home. We're gonna sing a song in a moment. And after we do, you just get up. And you just come and talk to one of our decision counselors up front. You may be a believer here today. As you sat there and you heard this story again, maybe for the 20th time or the 100th time, you say, you know what? That's, that's still me. I've, I've wandered. I've, I've drifted into the far country. And I need to come home to the Father. So friend, I would encourage you to come home and feel the love of the Father once again. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for Jesus. I, I thank you for the way that he taught. I thank you for the way that he loved. I thank you for the way that he died. That he intentionally went to a cross knowing the excruciating pain that he would experience. But he did it because he loves us. Father, I, I pray for those in this room tonight. Maybe they're hearing about your love for them for the very first time. I, I pray that, God, that it'll maybe be even a little overwhelming for them. That there is a God who loves them, who cares for them, that, that is for them, that's not against them. And God, that, that love that you have will just be magnetic and draw them home to the point that they would just get up. Father, I, I pray that all of us would live out of a sense of uh, joy and gratitude and thankfulness and hope and the fullness of life because of what you've done in and through us and how you've given us a future in heaven with you one day as you can wash away everything that we've ever done because of your amazing grace. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray tonight, amen.